Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. No good afternoons back. That's okay. Hopefully your mom's going to a pizza instead. Um, it's really an honor to be here back on campus in this capacity. Um, distinguished lecturer seems really, really important. Um, I can be honest, I don't think I attended too many distinguished lectures when I was a student. Um, so I, don't, I wouldn't say I have exactly a practice or a model for how this should look, should be structured, but I got something I think will be compelling. So, unavailable innovation. That's a, that's a strange juxtaposition of terms. So unavailable innovation. So the, the, our department, Electroengineering and Computer Science, the East Department, ECE specifically, CSE as well, all we do in this department is innovation. Like the act of research is trying to understand the impossible. Things that literally we have not thought about yet, we are trying to think about. Trying to push envelopes that may not even exist yet. And that's, uh, I had at our um, meeting this morning, I learned about a lot of the crazy research that's happening in the hardware side and the software side. MIMS, WIMS, uh, photonics, robotics, all kinds of things that, that people have never heard of, that normal people will never hear of, because you're not normal in this room. Sorry, break to you. <laughs> that you'll never hear about. <clears throat> That innovation is really important. It's the foundation of the prestige of our university and of our department. It's why we get millions and millions of dollars to do more research, to push the envelopes further. And it's how ultimately, by pushing the envelope in that sense for research, how ultimately things that start out as crazy, start out as impossible, become perceivable, then they become possible, then they become accessible, then they can ultimately become available. That's the reverse pipeline of how an idea goes from the clouds to in somebody's hands. But what's important to think about in that process is that the way that we engineer our innovation, the way that we think about problems to solve, challenges to address, products to deliver, our engineering mindset is relevant and important to be present at every step in that reverse pipeline. My first job, which wasn't a real job, um, my mother, who's in the back room, can attest to, was not a real job, was working with a, um, a guy who was a computer technician at General Motors. And he had a business on the side where he built computers. This was in 98. And when I say build computers, he literally took like RAM and put it on motherboards and took SCSI cables and attached them from motherboards to hard drives, put those into a plastic box and delivered that plastic box to a place. My first job was working with him, sitting on his living room floor in Southfield, Michigan, putting together computers like that. The first five computers I built, we installed at a community center in Detroit, it was called Weigel. It's now closed, unfortunately. Went to this wild community center, set up the tables to look kind of like this, put these fancy computers on them with these monitors and chairs, and I got a chance to install them and sit there with people who were using the computer for the first time, taught them how to do it. I taught a woman who was returning to the workforce after her children got a little older how to write a resume using Microsoft Word. Taught a senior citizen how to use the mouse playing solitaire. Taught a kid how to get to the internet for the first time. We define innovation, or we should define innovation, as something that has three characteristics. Being new, being different, and being better. If something doesn't meet all three of those tests, it's not innovative. Innovation should change possibility and change behavior. When I look back on it, the introduction of a computer to those people's lives was innovative in the sense that it was a new thing that they had never touched before. It was a completely different way of interacting with the world. And it was a better way to write a resume than writing, on, writing it by hand like you write notes. It was a better way to do that. That was innovative to that woman, for example. But the reason that that innovation actually mattered to her is because it was something she could touch. If I would have just built a computer 
and like put it in a box like we have that ENIAC in the East Building. Put it on a shelf somewhere where a person like her would not have been able to use it. It would have had no value to her. It would have been unavailable to her. So it wasn't really complicated engineering to say that not only do we need to deliver these, build these computers, we need to deliver them, we need to put them in this room, in this community center, we need to orient them in this way, we need to make a curriculum so that we can train people on how to use them. That wasn't super complicated to think about that process all the way through to understand how these people could benefit from having a computer available to them. But the principle applies to all of our ideas. We need to think about not only the technical piece of building the computer, but also the human-centered design challenge of making sure that computer is actually usable to someone that it can benefit. When I left college, I went to work at Microsoft. I worked at Microsoft for four years after interning there for three years. It was an amazing experience professionally. The reason I ended up leaving Microsoft four years into the game, though, was because I was working on really amazing software that was really powerful, that was really important to a set of people, but in my heart wasn't important to the right set of people. It was important to the people that ran Shell Oil Company. When I had a meeting with a guy that told me, um, so I worked on a product called SharePoint, and SharePoint was a, is an enterprise software platform. It does like ar archiving, document sharing, uh, permissions management, all kinds of things. And my job as a software performance engineer was to help our large corporate customers um, understand the right hardware they needed to purchase to have an optimal SharePoint deployment. So they would say, we need this SharePoint deployment to support 700,000 users in across 30 countries, and um, they're using it on mobile devices and on, on laptops, et cetera. And so given those inputs, my job was to say, you need to buy 17 front-end front -end machines that have these specs, 13 back-end machines that have these specs, connect them up in this way. And when I met with this guy from Shell Oil Company, he said, okay, well, um, guys, I need to talk to you about my deployment. And I said, all right, well, what's your scenario? Gave me a scenario. What's your budget? And he kind of smiled a little bit and looked at me and said, you know, girl, I don't, I don't really have a budget per se, so why don't you just tell me the best deployment you can give me and I'll take that. And at that moment, that was in 2008, I had a flashback to sitting there with the little girl teaching her how to use the internet on the west side of Detroit at Wild Community Center. I got into technology to help her do something different in life, not help that guy be more awesome at uploading documents. <laughs> All right. So that was innovation that was available to him, but it was innovation that I wanted to, that the type of innovation that I wanted to make available, the type of interaction I wanted to make possible. So a week before I got married, I quit Microsoft and moved from Washington State to Washington, D.C. because I wanted to apply this engineering mindset, this idea of taking innovation and making it available to more people in more contexts, I wanted to apply it in a different way. So I left Microsoft and I went to work at a nonprofit organization called the Center for Community Change. Not exactly the type of place you would expect a person with two engineering degrees to work. It's a nonprofit social justice organization that was started by the Kennedy family and a labor union that existed to empower low-income people to advocate for their political beliefs. <clears throat> Two engineering degrees, community organizing. I, this doesn't make sense, right? Thankfully, it actually did, because here was the problem that I was charged with solving. This organization had existed for 43 years. And over those 43 years, they had gotten really good at community organizing, really good at, at bringing people together, at like having meetings and saying, we're gonna come up with a strategy to, to, to 
put a stop sign here because there's a deaf kid on this block. We're going to get really good at saying we want to get an after school program at this school so that people can afford to work two more hours on their jobs so they can actually afford to pay their rent. They got really good at that. But it was 2009. And sometime before 2009, this thing called the internet had been invented. And they had no idea how to take advantage of that innovation. That innovation, that technological tool that was used to connect people in the 2008 presidential campaign, that was used to empower people, that was used to raise money, that was used to connect people in a way they could never do so before, that was innovation, that was a thing that existed that was not yet available to them. So they needed someone to be able to connect that dot. Someone to say, here is how this tool can create a new, better, and different experience of community building and community empowering for your organization and for the people that you support. So I got to spend two years using that engineering mindset that was like, how do you connect these systems together? How do you attack this complex problem of social ill? How do you break that down into things that you can actually deal with? And then how do you appropriately apply, in my case, connective technology to be able to help people come up with solutions to that problem? And I did that for two years. And we were successful. We were able to do things like, in a town of rural Missouri, there was a, uh, there was like a sawmill that had been closed. You know, it was, kind of, it was like a smaller version of what happened when um, GM left Flint but it was in Missouri, so uh, this, 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 this mill closed, like all these jobs were lost, and people were really kind of at a loss for what to do, how to define their community because this thing that was their anchor had been gone. So I decided that I couldn't solve the sawmill problem, <laughs> but what I could approach is how do we get people together to actually create an agenda for dealing with their community? For, for how, do, how do they want to move forward. And it turns out the internet's really good at having people be able to raise a voice, vote on things, agree on a direction, and then define that and go for it. So we helped people who maybe had never used a computer before, maybe only had a feature phone, not a smartphone. Um, how could they use the things, the tools they had available to them to be able to communicate with one another and solve these problems. We set up things like text message networks for people. We set up very basic, you know, largely text-driven uh, websites for people to be able to uh, facilitate community conversations around like, we want to come to an agreement about what the three most important things on this block are. Is it the street lights? Is it the neighborhood watch? Is it somebody's dog pissing on the grass? What are the important things that we need to deal with? And through that, we actually defined a community agenda for these people to really build a path forward and solve some problems. It was tremendously empowering. It wasn't like it was creating a 1,000 jobs to replace that sawmill. But what it did do is it began to create a level of community confidence. It began to, to reinforce the community pride that existed when that sawmill did create, both of which are the building blocks for, re, for defining a future. That was an engineering problem to solve. Even if the center for community change didn't realize that was an engineering problem. That was taking a complex thing, breaking it down into other, into simpler components, and addressing that with the technology and the tools you had available to you. That was applying innovations that someone else had thought of, that research had defined in the 70s, to a real hardcore brass tacks, real life problem for a person <coughs> in 2010. I worked in politics on um, trying to use technology in that way, to connect people in that way, for five years. And then the most important challenge that I've been able to face thus far came calling to me. So I'm from Detroit, born in Detroit, lived in the city for the first half of my life, lived in the suburbs for the second half of my ch uh, childhood until I came to Michigan. <clears throat> and Since I left after college in 2005, I've been trying to like find excuses to come home. So much so that, I, okay, as an aside, 
So in 2005, uh, me and, and two other friends, they both went to Michigan that I've known since I was in kindergarten in Detroit. We started a business, it was a terrible idea, um, called Detroit Intern. DetroitIntern.com. What that business was, um, was to basically stop people like me from leaving Detroit. So it was, if you can find an internship somewhere, you can probably find a job somewhere. And that was true in my experience. I had an internship with Microsoft and bam, I had a job with Microsoft three years later. That was great. If you could find a job in a place like Southeastern Michigan, maybe you wouldn't, person with two engineering degrees, leave Southeastern Michigan. Because you know what we could use in Southeastern Michigan? A bunch of people with degrees, right? We started that business right after, like, it was, let's see, I left in July, I pulled into, I, I flew into Seattle on July 8th, 2005. We started that business in September of that year. It didn't work. <laughs> it did not work. Um, but what it showed me was, I was actually serious about wanting to figure out a way to be useful to Detroit. <clears throat> I wanted to figure out how to do that. So this engineering problem that was in the back of my mind for years was what is the way that I, as a person who currently physically sits in another time zone, how can I be useful to my city? How can I apply my engineering mindset that was developed as a kid, molded here at University of Michigan, how can I use that to solve a problem? And in this case, that problem was being useful to Detroit. When I lived in D.C., that looked like starting an organization called Detroit Diaspora, which looked at this Detroit challenge as a network problem. No city in the United States lost more population, lost more people moving to other cities than Detroit, according to the 2010 census. No state in the country, the only state in the country that lost population, according to the 2010 census, was Michigan. That's because people were going from Michigan to places that there were jobs elsewhere, like Seattle like Chicago, like DC, like Houston, like Atlanta. People were leaving. It was like it, we were bleeding, 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 bleeding graduates. We were bleeding people, period. So my job, as I saw it, was to, that meant that there were a lot of Detroiters in all these other places. When I moved to DC, I had a birthday party a month after I moved there. We had 30 people at my house, and 20 of them were from Detroit. That told me that there was a network of Detroiters in DC. But the same thing was true with Seattle, same thing was true in Indianapolis, same thing was true in St. Louis, same thing was true in New York. So for you software people, we like looked at that node, that th those sets of nodes, and decided to connect them. Who are all of the Detroiters in this place? Can they all see one another? Can they come together and do things as mundane as talk about Detroit and how much fun it was to go play at this basketball court or to go jump in that pool or to go to the Tigers game? <clears throat> or can do things as significant as saying, how can we as a community in this city be useful to our city, the one that we share? That organization grew to 1,500 people very quickly and we had events all across the country. We were able to have facilitate conversations with city officials that, can, that were able to help convince people to move back to Detroit because they were able to get questions answered that dealt with their misperceptions or misconceptions of the city. It was trying to solve this engineering problem about how can you be useful to the city. Again, that was applying this innovation of network thinking in that, kind, in that case to helping support a place. Network thinking helping support a physical place. But then the Detroit Challenge got even more real for me in 2014. City of Detroit had just gone through an election, um, had elected a new uh, mayor, and the city was, uh, it was poised to do some pretty significant rethinking about how it worked, about how it delivered service, about how the government listened, about how it then responded to that listening about what people could expect from, city, from a government, from a local government. I saw that as a tremendous opportunity for innovation, a tremendous opportunity to do a rethink of how cities and citizens interact. That was very, 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 very seductive. This idea that I could apply the network thinking from Detroit Diaspora, 
the social prob- engineering problem solving from the Center for Community Change, the technical acumen from Microsoft and the University of Michigan to apply all of those things to Detroit, a place that I wanted to live anyway, that was an amazing opportunity that I could not pass up. So me and my wife, my 10-month-old twins, moved to Detroit in the summer of 2014. And I started in August, so a year and a half ago, excuse me, a year and a month and a half ago now, working to solve that problem. And in that time, I've had to innovate, literally create sometimes something from nothing. So for example, one of the ways we're trying to reset the relationship um, between citizens in Detroit and the city government is what I call growing the government's ears. So making it such that this public institution can listen to you in a more genuine way, can actually take in your input, your feedback, or whatever, and then can respond to it appropriately. The most concrete example of that is an innovation that we put in place in Detroit to respond to non-emergency service requests. Some cities call this 311, um, as opposed to 911 for emergencies. We created a system called Improve Detroit. It's a smartphone application, iPhone, Android. It's a web application, available at detroitamai.gov or cclickfix.com slash Detroit. And what people can do is they can go in and request a certain set of things be done. There's a tree that's blocking your driveway or blocking your sidewalk. You can get that fixed. There's a street light that's out on your street. You can get that fixed. You can snap a picture of it with your phone, answer a couple questions, boom, get it fixed. There's a, tr- there's a traffic signal, there's a red light that doesn't work in front of your, at, at your intersection. You can call and get that fixed. There's water running out of an abandoned building that no one lives in, but there's water spouting out of the ground. You can report that and get that fixed. You see a fire hydrant that's broken. You can snap a picture of it, answer a couple questions, get that fixed. Two years ago, if you saw any of those problems and you were gonna call the city to get them fixed, Good luck with that. You had no idea whether there was a phone number to even call, if someone was going to answer the phone, if somebody answered the phone, was it the right person? If they was the right person, were they going to actually record it or write it down? If they wrote it down, was it going to get put into some system to actually make sure someone responded to it? If it got put into the system, was someone actually going to respond to it? If someone actually responded to it, were they actually going to fix it? If they actually fixed it, were they going to fix it correctly? If they fixed it correctly, were you actually going to know it got fixed? The answer to all those things was no. So we decided to rethink this and say, okay, we're gonna be really deliberate. We're really gonna pick the services that we know that we can actually deliver on. We're gonna rebuild trust by saying, I can't offer you 100 services right now, but I can offer you these 25. And we're gonna look at a new way to deliver that service, a new way to let you know that service is being delivered. So when you use that smartphone application, snap a picture, answer a couple questions, you submit it you get an acknowledgement that that thing was received in an hour, automatically, to your phone or your email. The next day you get an update, bam, we assigned this to a, to a person, and they have been given a task to complete it within X days. Bam, that person got to the site, they looked at it, they can actually fix it. It'll be fixed in these days. Bam, that thing got fixed, here you go, here's a picture of it being fixed, go check it out for yourself and let us know what you think. That is a new, different, better experience to people actually getting something taken care of that they made a request about. But that experience, I argue, is actually not an available, a truly available innovation. Why is that not truly available if it fact just stopped there? Some of y'all may be aware that we have a tremendous challenge in the city of Detroit around internet connectivity. Depending on what study you read, somewhere between 40 and 55% of Detroiters do not have consistent access to high-speed internet. When I say consistent, I mean that either on a device that they own or on a device that they can access on a daily basis. What do we also know? Detroit has a very, very high penetration of cell phone usage and of smartphone ownership. So you think, okay, wow, smartphones, that's great, smartphones. It's really difficult to buy a smartphone without an unlimited data plan. It's actually really easy to do that. 
So, if you actually have a smartphone, but you may not have a data plan that is unlimited, that may be capped in some way, you begin to think very differently about how you use the internet on that smartphone. So one, is it, that's the channel that you get the internet from in the first place. And then two, you actually have to be really, you, you treat it like you don't have enough food, right? You're like, okay, well, I can eat this much today and that much tomorrow. On the City of Detroit's website, where more than 50% of people who visit it, visit it from a mobile device, we literally see a drop off in traffic at the end of the month. And that's because people ran out of data. So I'm not gonna go to the city website until after the first when I got data again, right? So that's for the kind of connected. For the disconnected, it's irrelevant. For my grandpa, like I could tell him we got a website, he don't know what a website is. He ain't never seen one. How then can he benefit from the innovation of improving the way we deliver service? How does that innovation become available to him? So here's how we have to solve it. This is an engineering problem. You have to think about how then do people access technology? How can someone benefit from this? In the case of people like my grandpa that are Detroiters who are disconnected or only marginally connected, you look at, well, what are the connectivity points that are fairly universal? In this case of Detroit, it was regular telephones. People that didn't have cell phones were very, very, very likely to have landline phones or access to them. So we had to make this smartphone application and website available to people that didn't have a smartphone or, or internet connected device. How did we do that? Anybody want to guess how we did that? <laughs> yes. Touch Close. <laughs> we need to make it that complicated. <laughs> now, if you call the city of Detroit mayor's office, for example, or any number of frontline staff people who are right now there, they're trying to answer the phone when a random person from the public calls, and you say, I'm calling and and there is a, a flashing red light um, two, two blocks away from my house that was working yesterday and now it ain't working. You call that number and the pers a person answers the number. Oh, he hello, sir, I understand you have a broken traffic light. Okay, where is that again? Well, you know how we can help you fix that, sir? I'm gonna use Improve Detroit. What does that person then do that's on the phone? They, because they're sitting at a computer, they bring up DetroitMI.gov slash service and they type in the improved Detroit request for you that way two things happen one a person is actually going to have their request heard in a legitimate way and two that request will be fulfilled in a way that benefits from all of the operational efficiency and innovation that we work so hard to deliver that innovation therefore becomes available to that person that didn't have an internet connected device. Now that's good, but it could be better. This is the challenge we're facing right now. Just because a person doesn't have a cell phone, smartphone, laptop, internet connected device, should that person not benefit from the feedback mechanism that we built into it? Shouldn't they get an acknowledgement that their request was received? Shouldn't they get an, an update as to what's happening with their, with their request? Shouldn't they get a notification when it's been fulfilled or completed? I think they deserve that. Everybody deserves the same respect in that regard, right? So now our challenge is to figure out how do we deliver those things to people that are, that are disconnected or marginally connected? That's the next engineering problem. Do we, is it as simple as we take that person's phone number and we call them back every time? That's not that efficient, you know. But is there some automated way to do that? There could be. Software is really, really fancy. Like, I'm sure we could figure something out that could call people. Hello, sir. The request that you submitted on X date is in Y status. We could do something to send you an automated text message if you got a cell phone. There's a feature phone. We could do that. How do you make the entire innovative product and process that you design 
entirely available to as many people as possible. Because this whole improved Detroit thing, like, doesn't, doesn't, we didn't just do it so that, you know, cool kids that live in Midtown with, with iPhones could benefit from it. We did it so that Detroiters, capital D, full word, every zip code, every census tract, every council district could benefit from it. And we already seeing results. Right now, more than 70% of the non-emergency service requests in Detroit come in through this platform, and it represents every zip code, every census tract, every council district. People are using it. But we still got a way to go because I still want everyone to be able to fully experience it, even if you don't have a device. I'm trying to make that complete innovation completely available to a complete set of people. Nobody needs to be left behind. It's important that we think about that as an engineering challenge, not a marketing challenge, not a communications challenge. It's not a matter of like, oh, well, if you just knew that it existed, you would like go to the app store and download it. If you knew that it existed and it was that great, you would like, it would motivate you to buy a cell phone. No, that's stupid. That's not how we think about it. We think about it as it's my job to engineer a solution that's accessible to you. That is part of my challenge. Not only to do something that is creative, that pushes the envelope, that's interesting, that's inspiring, and that's efficient, but that also is truly accessible. Once your idea gets to the point where it needs to hit someone's hands, you need to keep designing. You need to keep engineering. The other example that I'll give of this um, before we before I close is with our city's transparency initiative. <laughs> So a lot of times when, you, when you're engineering products or processes, they have target markets. They have target customers, right? There's a certain set of people that you expect to use this. For the government, the idea of target market is kind of, a, just kind of pernicious, right? Because on the one hand, like, there are certain things that we can design or optimize for certain communities. But on the other hand, like, everybody pay taxes, so they need to get a little bit of it, at least, right? So how do we figure out how to square that? How do we figure out how to make sure that any initiative that we create can benefit the widest swath of people? We embarked on a transparency initiative officially in the city of Detroit on February the 19th of 2014. We enacted a policy that was called Detroit Government Open Data Access to All, or Go Data. What that meant is that the city would no longer require individuals who cared about government operations to go through a very arduous process called the Freedom of Information Act request process to get information about the city. So to understand when and why and how a city knocked down a particular building, to understand the details of a particular crime that was committed, to understand the building permitting activity for this particular block. We decided we were gonna make that easy. We weren't going to make it cost any money. We were going to do the work of making public information that was already ostensibly public actually public by putting it on the internet. Okay, that's great. That's revolutionary. It's a great way to rebuild trust. Kind of like Improve Detroit with rebuilding trust in the sense that like when someone made a phone call and requested something, they could actually be confident that it would be delivered. We're also trying to build trust by saying that we're going to be honest about what's happening, good, bad, or ugly. Yes, a terrible thing happened on this block three hours ago. Yes, an amazing thing happened when we knocked down that abandoned house next to that school. We're gonna tell you about all that. But again, how do we make that available to everyone? There's a certain civic technology community, I'll call it, that's super, super passionately excited about that. They wanna see that data at DetroitMI.gov slash data. They wanna download it as a spreadsheet and they wanna do data science horrible things to you. Right, they want to chop it, screw it, slice it, make graphs, make charts, do analysis, build models, all kinds of great things that they're awesome and for y'all math people in the room, you think that's exciting too. There are also people who just want to know that house has been a nuisance on our on our block for a year. And I can't tell if anyone's ever gonna do anything about it. How can y'all fix that? So how do we make it so that someone by phone, by mail, by email, by text message, by, internet, by uh, web browser, 
can actually find out the status of a particular thing in the city. Can see what this what does the city of Detroit know about this place, this block, this address, this school, in a fully transparent way. And so we're building toward making all that information accessible in a simple format, and then going to be building on some of the other availability innovation tactics that we use on Improved Detroit to make sure that anyone, no matter what medium they choose to consume that information by, has it available to them. To make any of this innovation, in this case, in both policy and process as far as delivery of that information associated with that policy, how do we make that truly available to all Detroiters? If you can't tell, I'm biased towards solutions that are big because they solve an information problem for everyone. I think one of the things that's at the core of a lot of the inequity that's discussed in our city is something that, a term I, used, I learned at the University of Michigan called information asymmetry. And what it means is that any relationship, any interaction can be defined in terms of the different parties, access to, quality of, speed with which they can acquire or attain or learn information. So for example, if you are frustrated that you think that there is land development or land use activity that's happening that you don't have control over, one of the things at the core of that frustration is that those people knew where to buy stuff before you even knew it existed. Those people knew how to spend that money. Those people knew who to call. That's an inequity. That's asymmetry because you they have better information than you did. Improve Detroit, the transparency effort, it's seeking to right that shift. It's seeking to reduce or eliminate that asymmetry. It's seeking to make all the information available to everyone in an equitable fashion. And once we're all dealing with the same information, it's a lot easier to have a, a more rich and inclusive conversation. Because no one's left out because they don't know anything. No one's left out because they didn't have the ability or opportunity to understand something because we made that available to them. I think that's the biggest innovation, the most important innovation in all that we have to make available is methods of reducing information asymmetry. And that's at the core of what I'm doing in Detroit. It's at the core of how we're trying to rebuild trust in Detroit. And it's still the biggest and most exciting challenge that I get to solve every day. So with that, I thank you and I welcome any questions.